Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Um, Joel stole the mic, and then I'm not sure why. So, uh, you're not going to do anything at the beginning, I know. <laughs> He's going to come flying in on a zip line over the top today with his microphone. <laughs> Uh, so good to be here. I think it is incumbent upon me, though, to announce the fact that there is a new Mr. and Mrs. in our midst. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ord, Mrs. Teresa, and Mrs. Lucas just got married. So, uh, thank you. It's going to take a long time to knock that smile off of Lucas's face. Okay. <laughs> The wedding was absolutely beautiful, and uh, so it was a great, proud moment in our house, so that was good. So, um, yeah, why don't we uh, start with the community prayer today. Kyle is going to come up and, uh, and share it with us, so it's actually on the sheet that you have there, so you can follow along if you like. <coughs> Breathing, but not 
so good to be able to be reminded of uh, your goodness, your power, the fact that you're always moving when we're not even noticing you're always moving. You've saved us so many times and we've not even known that you've been there helping us. We thank you this morning, Lord. We thank you for your love. Speaks with us this morning. Give him your Holy Spirit and help him communicate the things that you put in his heart this morning. In Jesus' name. So we've had, kind of had two messages. We talked about Jesus two weeks ago and how we can be sure that he is God. Last week, we talked about who Mark is. This week, we're getting into the text. So when you come to church, bring your Bibles, okay? So that you can mark stuff up and so that you can just sort of get into it and understand it. Um, it's just going to be really great. So bring it every single week. For those of you at home, you can grab your Bibles now. We're going to turn to Mark 1. And we're going to really get into this passage, but before we do that, let's just let's just pause and ask the Spirit to come and just fill us, like we just sang. We just can't understand this stuff without Him. And do you ever realize how you'll hear a sermon and you'll be like, "Yeah, God, that's exactly who I want to be," or "That's exactly what I want to do," and then by Tuesday you've forgotten? Like that happens to me all the time. And so when the Holy Spirit comes and changes our hearts, He transforms us. And, and it's a permanent shift when it's the spirit and when it's not just wisdom. It's a massive difference. So let's ask the spirit to fill us individually um, for 10 seconds if you want to do that. And then I'll pray for us. Yeah, Jesus, we... We welcome you here, God. We ask you to flood this place, God. God, at Pentecost, it was an overflow. It was an abundance. We ask for that too, Jesus, that God, where there's hopelessness, Father, that the Spirit would come and just give us hope, God. Where there's a lack of understanding, God, we pray that your Spirit would give us eyes and ears to see and hear, Jesus, what you have. Thank you, Father. We love you. Amen. Okay, Mark 1, we're getting into it. As a little boy, I had a terrible experience one time. Do you remember when you were little, like so small, that when you're sitting in the passenger seat of a vehicle, your chin could go right on the little, uh, 
Why? It's one of my nose. Your chin could go right on the little door handle thing. You guys know what I'm talking about? You remember those days where you could just put your, your chin on there and look out? I was doing that in my dad's delivery truck, and I had my chin there. And I had my hands kind of up there too, and there's a little button there to open the door. And I thought, how far do I have to pull this thing for it to click open? And so that's exactly what I did. I pulled on that handle, and the next thing I know, the door is wide open, and we're driving down the highway. I don't know if you remember this, Dad. And I am losing it because my whole body's out, and I'm essentially flying, and I'm going, like, you know, 100 miles an hour, like Superman through the air. And I thought death was about to happen to me. I held on for around 15 minutes. It was just kidding. It's not that bad of a fall. It was probably two or three seconds. But it felt like forever, and I thought to myself, I have way too much to live for. Slurpees, Transformers, road hockey. I'm not letting go of this situation. So eventually he hauls me in. Mark, this guy, got dragged by a horse for two days. And I just can hardly, I can't get past this point that 10 minutes into getting dragged by a horse, he hasn't, just think about how long that would be. For 48 hours, he continued to, to hold on and have hope that he could stop this torture and once again preach to the church in Africa. Like, this guy lived for the gospel. This guy was incredible. He was born a rich kid. His father, his name was Aristopolis. Such a cool name, eh? Aristopolis. Somebody should call this child Aristopolis. Like, his nickname could be Ari or something like that. But anyways... His name was Aristopolis, but his dad died when Mark was a teenager and left Mark with all of the wealth, including a house. So Mark is this young, cool kid with a house. Every single girl in Jerusalem would have been like, hey, Mark. <laughs> I mean, they don't have any voices like that. That's right, boys. <laughs> I'm like that voice. They would have been like, wow, Mark, this guy with the house, this guy, like, the world was his oyster. He could do anything. He had wealth, a house, he had it all. And he chose a completely different path. He used his house as the first church. Did you guys know this? Remember when Peter was in prison between the guards and, and the, the church is praying for him? That was in Mark's house. An angel came and rescued Peter. He walked out of the, the prison, and he went and knocked on the door of that house, and the servant boy answers and thought it was Peter's ghost and didn't let him in. That was Mark's house. Eventually, Peter gets let in, and he's probably like, why don't you let me in? He's like, got people running after him. Dogs are barking in the background. That's Mark's house. How about the Last Supper? Do you guys know what this event is? You know the famous painting? You know where the Lord's Supper took place? the breaking of the bread, the pouring out of the wine. This was at Mark's house. Mark's living room was where the Last Supper took place. And this was incredibly risky for Mark because this was at a time where if he would have been caught, the house was gone, his money was gone, his freedom, and probably his life. And he's risking it all for this thing. Incredible. Mark writes his book in 66 AD, and Caesar Nero had been reigning for 30 years. This guy was cruel. This is perhaps one of the most violent men that has ever lived on earth. And 30 years in, Mark writes this letter. So he has seen thousands of his friends get brutally murdered by this man. And not only that, this was a time where there was a big fire in Rome. Two thirds of the city was burned down and Nero blamed the Christians, and it unleashed a persecution like they had never seen before. Millions of Christians were killed at a time where the world population was probably only 60 million. So like a good chunk of the population was killed by Nero, and mostly Christians. Incredible. This is what Tacitus, a historian, says. It's on your little page there. If you want to turn your little page, this Roman historian says this, punished with the most cruelty upon their confessions that Jesus is Lord, they were covered with skins of wild animals and torn to shreds by dogs or hung on, hung on crosses. And if death eluded, they were lit like lanterns to burn by night. So this is the background of Mark. 
This is a rich young kid who gave his house to the church. And it's scary. Listen to what Hebrews says about that time. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. This is the Bible. This isn't a historian. This is, this is the word of God. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins. Remember what Tacitus said, that they were put in the Colosseum, and skins were put on them, and then dogs would come and attack them? This is what Hebrews is talking about. Destitute, persecuted, and mistreated, the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. Mark chose this life instead of the life of luxury. So as we're reading Mark, that background has to be forefront in our minds, because this is who this kid was. He sacrificed absolutely everything. He found incredible, transcendent life, and the world was not worthy of him. Isn't that a cool statement? Imagine at your funeral one day if they said, wow, I'll tell you what, the world is not worthy of this person. Put your name there. Mark had some really crazy encounters. Listen to Mark 14. This is hilarious. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. <laughs> Mark is with Jesus. They go to grab him. They grab his loincloth, and Mark runs away naked. And I like that this is his account. So he doesn't name himself. He just says, a young man. But everybody reading it, every church that this would have been read in would have been like, oh, yeah, Mark, we all heard it was you. So Mark is like running. A, this is not just a bad dream. We all have this dream, don't we? Right? You end up somewhere strange and you're naked. And you just, whatever, maybe. No, we all do, I'm pretty sure. But this was the life that he lived where those bad dreams were reality. He had, the focus of his whole life was the gospel. And it was a conscious decision. But we often let life just happen to us. You ever realize that? We just let life happen. Choices we make, people we end up associating with and living with, decisions on how we spend our money, careers. We often just go with the flow and we never really just stop and just say, okay, what am I living for? What's the purpose of my whole life? So many people live for their kids. And there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But the problem is, is that once kids graduate, empty nesters often have a really hard time because their kids were their God. Or else we live for pleasure. But what happens is that when we get used to those pleasures or we get older and don't enjoy them in the same way or whatever might happen in our lives, suddenly we have a crisis. Or sometimes we live for our careers, and that all ends the same way. All of these different lifestyles make us miserable, and I'm gonna explain that in just a moment. But grab your Bibles now, let's turn to Mark 1, verse 1. We're gonna get into it. Why in the world did Mark choose to live for the gospel? Mark 1, <laughs> the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. This is a loaded introduction. We hear this and we just hear biblical terms. That word good news is also gospel in some of your translations. The son of God, yeah, classic. But this is a loaded introduction. The first line in any book of the Bible, if, if you read the first line, it's called the incipit. It's the thesis or the summary of what's to come. Today we just have paper for everything. If you open a, a book today, there's just like a foreword. This is the, the details of the publisher. Here is a little page with nothing on it. Here, and then all of a sudden, 20 pages in, you get to the actual start of the book. But back then, paper was so expensive, they made it out of um, papyrus, which was on the riverbanks of the Nile. It was a reed, it was so expensive. So the incipit, the one sentence that summed it all up was so short. Mark is saying this is what my entire book is about. This is it. It is the gospel. 
And this isn't a Christian word. This is a Greek word that he co-opted. It's a word that was euangelion, this Greek word. It was a political word. When a new king was appointed, they would show up with horses and these chariots, and a guy would come out with a trumpet. <laughs> he was called the herald. They would blow the trumpet and be this big thing, and they would say, by the way, Herod, or sorry, Caesar Nero is the new king. And everyone would be like, yeah. And then they go to the next town. That is the gospel. It is proclaiming a new king in that kingdom. That's euangelion. But this is not about Caesar. It's about Jesus. This is why they wanted to kill Mark. This is why the disciples died, because they said the gospel is about a different king, not Caesar. And get this. Mark says that Jesus is the Son of God, and this is dangerous language. Rome called the Caesars the Son of God. Look on your page there. You see there's a coin on your page? If you're at home, you can Google search this. Just Google search, I don't know, Caesar coin, first century. You'll see it. There's a little inscription on there. It says this in Greek, Divius Phileos, which means Son of God. The Caesars were always called the sons of God, the go-between between between God and man. And so Mark, in this first incipit, is saying, number one, this gospel, the euangelion, is about Jesus, not Caesar, and he is the son of God, not Caesar. Crazy. But who is the herald for this? Because they would always pick this cool guy with a cool chariot and a cool horse. Listen to the herald that Mark lays out. Mark 1 verse 2. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make paths straight for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. This created such shockwaves in the Greek world that everybody is going out to this different herald to speak of a different king. This shocked people. Every single person went up confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you like the Holy Spirit. See, John was just like Mark in that he also got killed in a brutal, violent way. There was a party that started to get really out of hand. And in this party, there was tons of drinking, and, and the king started to ask girls to dance. This was a completely out of hand party. And this girl named Herodias starts to dance and she's doing real good and the king wants to look powerful and so in charge and he says, hey you. And the whole audience just would have been dead quiet. And he says, I give you an oath. You can have anything you ask of me. He's probably had too much to drink. And everybody in the audience starts talking. They're all like, what's she gonna take? She could take that city. She could take, she could take this wealth. She could take anything that she wants. Thank you. And everybody is so curious as to what she was gonna take. And then she announces, as she whispers into her mom ear, she says, I want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. You're thinking, what? Everybody was shocked because they loved John. Everyone loved John. And so the party went on and nobody knew what was going to happen. Was this going to happen? Was the king going to do this? Sometime later, a guy shows up with a platter and John the Baptist's head is now at the party. Just imagine. This is a fancy party and now there's a head. And there it is, just plopped on the table. It's John. This shocked everyone. This is Herod, and he did a despicable thing. He was married, but he fell in love with his niece. And his niece wasn't just his niece, so that's gross. Why did he do that? 
She was also married to his brother. So he took her as his wife, and everyone else wouldn't say a word because Herod would have had them killed. But John the Baptist publicly outed him and said, this is despicable in the sight of God. So John the Baptist was thrown in prison. Jesus said that John the Baptist was the greatest of all men, that he would not conform to the pattern of this world. He said, what do you expect to go out there and see a reed bending? In other words, someone that just compromises like everybody else? He says, be like this man. There's something in John that we need to replicate. He took a vow. It's called the Nazarite vow, where they couldn't cut their hair, so he had a big beard. We don't have to replicate that part unless you want to. He had six enormous dreadlocks, which he tied in a sack, or else you'd have a massive headache constantly. He wore camel hair and ate bugs dipped in honey because they were part of a very poor person's diet. Mark quotes Isaiah next. He says, this is who it is, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert the highway for our God. But listen to the rest of it. A voice says, cry out, and what I said, what shall I cry? Imagine if, if we had the ear of all of Kelowna, and we repeated this next sentence. All people are like grass. They are like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. What a statement. Everything in Kelowna is passing away. All of it. All of these towers that are going up will come down one day. I'm not saying I'm going to do that, just to be honest. They're right out in the open. But all this is passing away. Our wealth, our systems... All of it. It used to be that if you went back east, you'd go to churches and there'd be graveyards on the front lawn of churches, right? So you'd walk past the graves of loved ones and you'd remember the fact that one day you will be in that dirt. You'll remember that one day there will be a little gravestone with your name on it. So before you went and worshipped God, you recognized, oh my goodness, I am like grass. I will wither and fade. But what God is doing is permanent and eternal. Listen to what else he says. Verse 12, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hands? Oh, imagine that for a second. God is measuring the oceans of the world in the hollow of his hand. In the time I was speaking at this conference, and there was this big buff army guy in the front row, and I had a garbage can full of water. And I said, hey, do you think you can lift this garbage can of water over your head? And he's like, yeah. this guy's from, he's from the U.S. And he comes up, and he grabs this thing from both sides, and he's lifting it like this. And when he tried to pivot and transfer, the whole thing came down on him. All of Green Bay stage was wrecked. It was hilarious, though, and a great lesson. Water is incredibly heavy. Like, he weighs the waters in the palm of his hand. Or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens. That is God. I, I once saw a scientist that, that had a straw, and he took the straw and he pointed it up in the sky and he looked through the hole. And he said, in that hole, there are billions of stars. And there's billions of stars there, and there, and there, and down here, like, you know, going through the earth. And then this guy started to tear up. He's like, it is so vast, we can't even comprehend. And God's hand marks off the heavens. Come on, church. We are like grass. We wither. Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket? Or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. This is this language right here. This is an affront to the, to the Greek empire. It's saying... Your euangelion, your gospel, it is a bunch of garbage. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Before him all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. Our wealth, our pleasure, our titles are less than nothing. Do you guys hear me? Less than nothing. Take the richest guy in Kelowna less than nothing take the most powerful person on the planet 
less than nothing. The might of the mightiest army, less than nothing. Incredible. And then what does John do? He's baptizing them. You've got to understand that this also is not a Christian symbol. This was a Jewish symbol. John stole it. <laughs> this was a ritual purification that they used to do. It was called the Tevila. Jews used to baptize, baptize Gentiles that were converted. And he is now taking their symbol as a symbol of defiance, of death and resurrection. See, Jesus says the craziest thing to the disciples. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up your cross and follow me. You guys ever thought about what that means? Deny yourself and take up your cross? They would have understood this completely back then. The Aramaic audience, the word deny yourself usually meant that you, you stop being who, who you are. This one guy came to me, he, he wanted to follow Jesus so bad, and he said, but I love motorbiking, he said to me. He said, God won't want me to motorbike anymore. And I said, since when? Where did he get this idea from? See, God made us and loves us. He knows what we naturally love. He created us individually and unique. He loves that. That's not what self here is. You see, he uses the Aramaic word napsha, not the normal word shari, which is what they always would have used. This word napsha is a word for self, but also a word for servant, or sorry, serpent or snake. It means false self. Jesus says, deny your false self, your titles that mean nothing, and take up your cross. People on a cross, they were naked. Did anyone look cool hanging on the cross? Did anyone think, wow, that guy's really built? No, they're like, oh my goodness, that guy's covered in blood and dead. They didn't have any status on the cross or esteem, no friends, no spouse, no family, no money. Your image was only one thing, that as a follower of Christ. And this is why John the Baptist wore camel hair. Do you think he was trying to look cool? This is why King David, when he danced, he took off his robe, his kingly robe, and said, forget this identity. And he's like running around in his underwear. Isaiah ran, ran around naked for three years. Did you know that? What happened to Mark and he ran home? Isaiah chose this for three years. Jesus said, if you want to find real life, you have to lose your false identity. And then Jesus, okay, this is wonderful. Verse 9, if you're following along in your Bibles, Mark 1, verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Jesus came to John and was baptized. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Incredible. Heaven was torn open. Can you imagine what that would look like? What if all of a sudden God tore open heaven right here? What? Anyone have any idea what that would possibly look like? And we just see, we just saw the splendor of his kingdom. What would that be? You see, when we lay down our lives, he opens up heaven in our lives. And why did the spirit descend like a dove? Mark's first language was Aramaic, and they read a translation called the Targums. And in these translations, in it, it says that creation, that the spirit flapped his wings over the oceans like a dove. Mark is saying here that he's doing a new creation, that everything is being made new. God is calling us out into a brand new kingdom with a whole new king. It's a totally different way of living with a different value system. If you look on your sheets there, there's a picture of two guys hugging. You can Google this later if you're at home. I know that sounds, you're thinking, what kind of picture is that? One of them is Kenyan runner, Abel Mutai. And the other guy is Spanish runner, Devon Fernandez. And they were in a race and Abel had won, and he was a few meters from the finish line, and he got confused by the signage, and he stopped. He thought it was over. 
But Ivan came along and saw what had happened, and he started yelling in Spanish, but, but Abel didn't understand him. And so what happened was Ivan grabbed him and pushed him over the line, basically tackled him. And then he's like, what are you doing? Like, this is not part of running. <laughs> and then he realized what had happened, and they hugged each other, and somebody snapped that picture. Incredible. A reporter said, to Ivan, why did you do this? And his response was, my dream is that one day we can have a community life where we want other people to win. The reporter said, but man, you could have won, like, the money. You could have, like, bragged about this your whole life. Like, what are you doing? And he says, but what would be the honor of that medal? What would my mom think of me, he said. <laughs> what would my mom think? This is what he was thinking of the finish line. Oh, no, I could pass him, but what will my mom think? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Values are transmitted from generation to generation. And our values are being transmitted into Kelowna. People are thinking, what are we about? What do we value? Where we're transmitting our values by how we live. And so often in Kelowna, we live to look good and to hold power and to pursue wealth and influence. And you know what happens with that so often? is that we use people that are in a, pl a position of vulnerability for our own good. He could have easily used this mistake for his good, and he didn't. These values are transmitted. I'll never forget, we were promised growing up that we were gonna go to Disneyland one day. <laughs> Sorry, two stories about you, Dad. <laughs> and we thought we were gonna go to Disneyland. We'd never been, this was incredible, and we were gonna go one summer, and then our church decided that it wasn't big enough, and it wasn't, and decided to do a building project. And my dad told us we're not going to Disneyland, and we're using the money instead for the building project at church. I was mad. <laughs> Who wouldn't be, right? But those values are passed down from generation to generation. And I believe that I have those values now, and I pass those down to my kids because of this beautiful act of sacrifice. The same act that Mark did, say, God, take my house and use it. They might take it and I don't care. He's saying I live for the different gospel. I live for a different king. John was the greatest man in history because he was set apart. Mark used his home for superior purposes. Let me encourage you, use your stuff for superior purposes. Don't just live and not think about it. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not second, not, not what you have left over, but first. Me and Melissa made a conscious decision that we would give to the church the first of each month. Because what goes to God is first. And everything else is second. And Jesus said this, and I will provide for you. It's a guarantee. He said, seek first my kingdom of righteousness, and all that other stuff will be added to you. But it's an incredible act of trust. Mark said, I'm seeking you first, Jesus. And look what happened in his life. His life just ignited. He didn't want to die behind that horse because he was so on fire. Incredible. And he says, and seek righteousness. John the Baptist never bent. He never wavered. He sought holiness. And so often that's sort of like looked down upon as negative in our time to try to be holy or seek holiness. But that's not true. God is holy. So when we, when we pursue holiness, we're pursuing God who is holy. It's so good. So we've been given this symbol from Mark's living room to do every time we gather. It's communion. It's a laying down of our lives. It's sharing in the death of Jesus. It's saying, I want to be hidden in Christ with my identity being his identity. I'm going to seek superior pleasures. My kids aren't my God. Wealth is not my God. Pleasure is not my God. I actually live for a different kingdom. And so every time we take communion, we're, we're proclaiming that. And we're going to do that right now. I'm just going to invite the, the team on up. Come on up. Worship team and communion team. And this is a massive... 
subversive thing that we're doing in this place. This is what we're doing is we're proclaiming that, guess what? In our lives, the wealth of Kelowna is not our God. We have a different king. The values of Canada, they are not our God. We have a totally different king. Isaiah 40, verse 15, Surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. Before him all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. Would you pray with me? So Jesus, I thank you so much that you've come that we may have life that is abundant, Father. God, I pray that for each one of us who have been living for this kingdom, God, I pray that you give us the courage to just reorient, God, to seek your kingdom first, Father. God, I pray that in our hearts right now, Jesus, that you would reveal that all the nations are like dust, God, that you measure the water in the hollow of your hand, that your hand marks off the universe. You are the king of all kings. And we will be with you for all eternity. To your kingdom there is no end. Praise you, Jesus. It's not up in the air. There's no question as to our future. There will be no change in leadership. part in this incredible ceremony, God, where we lay down our lives and pick up a superior way of living, God, a different king. God, that you would just encourage each one of us in our inner person in this place, Jesus. God, come and do a work in us. We love you. So we're going to hand out the elements and uh, we'll take part in them all together um, after this song.
lives of futility for the life of the everlasting King. We get to be transferred from this kingdom to the eternal kingdom. Praise the Lord. Jesus took the bread and he broke it. He says, my, my, my body will be broken for you. He invites us to share and lay down our, our napsha, our false self, to be born new, to be a new creation. He said, eat this in remembrance of me. will also taste death in the same way. But he said that just as you will see me rise, also you are invited into this brand new covenant. It's incredible. He said, drink this in remembrance of that covenant. Amen. Well, that's good. Well, next week, um, it's Thanksgiving. And uh, we're going to have some special treats, some probably some pies and other fun things like that. We're going to spoil ourselves before we spoil ourselves later in the afternoon. Um, but yeah, so come along. If you know somebody that doesn't really have like family or any ability to get that sort of thing, invite them to church. Graham's going to be speaking on the gospel. We're going to like even further explain this UN Gelion, this incredible new kingdom with this incredible new king. So that's next week. Okay, friends? So we'll see you then, but have a wonderful week, and uh, yeah, we'll see you later.